uh, what we're doing here as far as some of the huge issues that people with Parkinson's and their families face whenever they either go to hospital or even into a long-term care facility. We are very aware of the horrendous issues that people face um, regarding trying to get their medications on time. Uh, we have, in fact, a program here that has been developed by my colleague John Collins. It is called the Get It On Time program. And um, it has been in existence now for a few years. But we do not feel, the staff here I'm talking about and myself, do not feel that we have um, done as good a job as we could have done with uh, the Get It On Time program and being able to roll it out. So I just want to reassure all of you out there who either have faced or are currently facing issues with loved ones and hospitalization and getting it on time, uh, getting medications on time, that we are reviewing the Get It On Time program as we speak, developing more effective ways of providing training and rolling it out throughout Central and Northern Ontario. Um, so I just want to reassure you that, again, we are aware that this is a huge issue and that we are actively taking sta uh, steps to educate all healthcare professionals about the importance that people with Parkinson's must have their medications given to them on time. Okay, so now on with today's uh, program. Um, I couldn't resist this, so sorry if um, I, you know, you don't like what I'm going to say, but anyway, bottom line is this is called dental care and Parkinson's disease. So once again, I've bitten off more than I can chew. <clears throat> All right, sorry, just couldn't resist that. Dental care is generally not at the forefront of a person's health care priorities until something in the mouth either hurts, swells, breaks, turns uncomfortably yellow, or just plain smells bad. If not to you, then because your sense of smell may be non-existent or compromised, then to those close to you who may avoid being close to you because of your bad breath. If you have a good oral hygiene regime, many of your oral problems can be prevented or at least minimized since the teeth and gums are the most accessible areas on the inside of the body. Daily oral hygiene, as straightforward as it may seem, i.e. brush and floss, is really a complicated fine motor skill that requires good manual dexterity in order to be effective. People with Parkinson's have a great potential for having problems achieving a good, beneficial effect, thus exposing yourself to increased risk for dental decay, abscesses, and soft tissue gum infections. I have spoken to you previously about the fact that even a mild infection with minimal symptoms can upset the apple cart of a person with Parkinson's and even trigger psychiatric symptoms such as hallucinations and delusions, and no one wants that. There are a number of things, there are a number of things that one can do to minimize oral problems. First and foremost is to think of oral hygiene as infection control. Over 10 different types of bacteria have significant roles in gum diseases, and several different species of bacteria are responsible for various forms of tooth and root decay. The goal of effective oral hygiene, then, is to minimize the total amount of bacteria and bacterial food sources on a regular and, f and frequent basis. Note, I did say effective hygiene. Putting toothpaste on a toothbrush, showing it to your teeth, 
and giving them a quick, quick, a quick once-over light dusting is not what I mean by effective oral hygiene. For a healthy person, once or twice a day might be enough, as bacteria need to adhere to both tooth and gum surfaces and colonize sufficiently to do any damage. For people with Parkinson's, however, greater care must be exercised to prevent oral infections. Brushing, flossing, use of special cleaning devices, and rinsing after each meal and snack, while it may seem over the top and excessive, often is necessary to control bacterial activity in the mouth. It is important to begin with to have your dentist establish a baseline of your current dental status, including your gums, including your gums, I should say, through scaling and root planing by a hygienist, in, and that's a very important habit to get into if you're not currently doing this on a regular basis. And by regular, I mean at least every four to six months. Of prime importance is the establishing of a baseline of your salivary function. Saliva is not just spit. It has critical roles in lubricating, moisturizing, and remineralizing the teeth. Another primary beneficial role of saliva is that it provides antibacterial substances for the tissues. Anti-Parkinson's medications, including Cinemet and Prolopa, Requip and Mirapex, can grammatically decrease the flow of saliva, causing dry mouth. This oral dryness will allow a number of oral problems to occur, such as tooth decay and increased inflammation of the gums. Saliva also controls the pH of your mouth to keep it from being either too acidic or too alkalizing. It also helps with food removal of food debris in the mouth. So if you have a dry mouth, food will stay in your mouth and eventually lead to infection. Again, something that nobody wants. Signs and symptoms of dry mouth include Problems with eating, speaking, when I say that, your tongue gets stuck to the roof of your mouth, and swallowing. Dry, crumbly foods, such as cereals and crackers, may be particularly difficult to chew and swallow if your mouth is dry. For those of you out there who wear dentures, you may have problems with denture retention in other words, keeping your dentures in your mouth, and also may develop denture sores more frequently than you used to. Food not tasting like you think it should is also a symptom of dry mouth. A painful tongue can be a big problem. An increased need to drink water, especially at night, is often a sign of dry mouth. And something that I call the lipstick sign in women, where lipstick adheres to the front of the teeth, is often a sign of dry mouth. You may have had an increased number of cavities, inflammation of your lips and cracked lips, an inflammation on the tongue, and even ulcers on your tongue, as well as on the gums, can be a symptom of dry mouth and also, as I said before, bad breath. Treatment of dry mouth includes drinking plenty of water, take frequent sips throughout the day in order to keep your mouth as moist as possible all day. Sucking on ice chips as well throughout the day can help keep your mouth from getting too dry. Chew sugarless gum. Interesting that chewing gum is also a helpful reminder to swallow for those indivi individuals who are having problems with drooling. Gosh, like everything else about Parkinson's, it's either too much or too little. 
you have too much movement, too little movement, or too much saliva, or too little saliva. Anyway, sorry, I digress. Back to dental issues. Suck on hard candies, sugarless, of course, unless you have swallowing problems. Avoid alcohol. Hopefully that means excessive alcohol use. On this note, many mouthwashes contain large amounts of alcohol, so check the bottle before you buy it, as alcohol can make your mouth dry. So while you may think that buying a mouthwash will keep your mouth wa uh, rinsed and uh, moist, if it has too much alcohol, it will do just the opposite. Avoid irritating dry foods, as well as spicy foods, or food that is excessively hot or cold. Avoid sugary, sugary or acidic foods and beverages. Use a humidifier in the room where you sleep. Often this can help to keep both your mouth as well as your nasal passages moist throughout the night. Keep in mind, caffeine is also dehydrating, so maybe drinking less tea or coffee will help. Continuing on with the topic of treatment for dry mouth, the most common product on the market is a product called Biotene. That's B-I-O-T-E-N-E. -E. Biotene comes in several forms. There is a Biotene Dry Mouth Kit, a Biotene Dry Mouth Toothpaste, Biotene Gentle Mouthwash, and Biotene Dry Mouth Gum. Another product that is often used and easily available is called Oral Balance. This is a long-lasting moisturizing gel. I've had positive anecdotal feedback about both these products in the past. There are also some saliva substitutes available, such as something called the Entertainer's Secret Spray, made by a company called KLI Corporation. Another product, Moisture Spray, M-O-I hyphen S-T-I-R spray. There's also moisture oral swab sticks. Optimist spray is a, is a Colgate palm olive spray that is used as a saliva substitute. There is also something called Zero Tube, X-E-R-O hyphen L-U-B-E, Zero Lube, and another product called Orex. O-R-E-X. Salivart preservative is a preservative-free aerosol, and that is spelled S-A-L-I-V-A-R-T. Also, make sure to check with your dentist or your dental hygienist for their recommendations as well, and ask your pharmacist for some suggestions too. Another tip to try to avoid uh, dry mouth and to treat dry mouth is that dentures should not be worn during sleep and kept clean overnight by soaking them. Dry mouth can sometimes be alleviated as well by eating celery and carrots throughout the day to help keep your mouth moist as well. If having a dry mouth is causing your food to taste bland papery, or otherwise unpleasant, adding flavor enhancers, sometimes such as increased herbs and condiments, and even fruit extracts, can make food more palatable. If your lips are dry, there is a jelly on the market called K-Y jelly. That's K-Y jelly. There's also uh, a hydrous lanolin available. Often people use Vaseline and petroleum-based products to try to make your lips moist, but in fact that can make your lips even drier as those products pull
pull water out of the tissue and therefore should be avoided. Oral health for people with Parkinson's is compromised for several reasons, such as poor muscle eye coordination, decreased digital dexterity, loss of hand and finger dexterity, decreased tongue and cheek and lip control. All of these things are fine motor skills that are required to effectively brush and floss our teeth. Also, people with Parkinson's often have a weakened swallowing ability, which can increase the risk of aspiration and choking issues, which I have addressed in previous presentations. For this reason, it is important to make your dentist and your hygienist aware that you have Parkinson's, as this may alter the way he or she performs some treatments for you. For example, you may require more frequent suctioning during your regular cleaning appointments so that water and saliva don't pool at the back of your throat. Also, you may need to sit up a bit straighter so that the chair is not so reclined and tipped back so far, as that could also promote a swallowing problem. You can also set up nonverbal communication with the hygienist and dentist, so that if you feel water collecting in your mouth, you can just raise your hand and they will stop what they are doing to allow you to swallow or so that they can suction you right then and there. Don't allow too much water, etc., to pool at the back of your throat. So if swallowing is a problem for you, don't let it stop you from going to the dentist on a regular basis, as there are things you can do to avoid yourself, to, to do for yourself to make your visits with the dentist less traumatic. As many of you listening today are only too aware, after taking your anti-Parkinson medications for several years, you may have developed dyskinesias, those wiggly involuntary movements that may make dental appointments during your on times or the times when your medication is being very effective and allowing you to move, those on times and dyskinesias can be very challenging for both for you as well as the hygienist and dentist. Again, you will have to be somewhat creative about the timing of your appointments as it, as it is very difficult to perform any kind of effective treatment on a moving target. Dyskinesias can also affect the jaw, which can cause not only tooth grinding and abnormal wear and tear on the teeth, <clears throat> but also your temporal mandibular joint. That's the hinge at the back of the jaw, whose job it is to open and close your mouth. That hinge can be affected by dyskinesia and become very painful. Boy, aren't I just full of good news today. So, onward and upward. What else can I come up with that are possible barriers to dental health if I haven't come up with enough already? In addition to the motor-related difficulties, I'm talking about the ones associated with Parkinson's, such as your um, eye-hand coordination, etc., there are also behavioral changes that may ne negatively impact your dental care. These include apathy, depression, forgetfulness, all of which may lead a person with Parkinson's to pay less attention to his or her daily dental health. Other behavior changes can also affect nutrition. For example, people with Parkinson's sometimes require greater caloric intake than those without Parkinson's, and some individuals will experience a decreased appetite. This problem, combined with poor dental hygiene, often leads to a tendency to avoid 
nutrient-rich foods, like vegetables, which require the ability to chew well. It can also lead to some people developing a sweet tooth, which may put you at greater risk for cavities. People with moderate and severe cognitive impairment, which means a problem with memory or concentration, as well as the ability to focus, often have problems performing many daily self-care routines, including dental hygiene. If memory is an issue, you are more likely to miss your appointment at the dentist's office or report pain or discomfort to your care partners, meaning that problems may go unaddressed for too long and a repair could possibly turn into a removal, i.e. tooth extraction. There are early signs to look for if you are worried that your own dental care or that that of a loved one is declining. These include infrequent toothbrushing, difficulties rinsing during daily routine <coughs> dental care, poor, dental, poor denture care, and trouble sitting through meals, possibly due to frustration with the inability to chew properly, or may also be a sign <coughs> that there is discomfort in the mouth that has not been mentioned. Strategies for improving dental care are, so what can a person with Parkinson's or a caregiver do to ensure that the Parkinson's does not stand in the way of good dental hygiene? Here are a few tips. I'm sure many of you have already thought this, but the simplest intervention is an electric toothbrush, which provides fine and repetitive motions that protect teeth most effectively. If you prefer the brush to brush your teeth in the old-fashioned way, using a normal, regular toothbrush, use a wider handled toothbrush and always buy a brush with soft bristles. Use toothpastes which are alcohol and detergent free. Toothpaste with a high fluoride content such as Colgate Prevident is a good choice. Brush it on in the morning and leave it on for at least one to three minutes. Do not swallow this particular high fluoride toothpaste. If possible, try to leave the paste on for longer than three minutes, as this will provide more protection with the fluoride in the toothbrush, in the toothpaste, I should say. If you have dentures, you can also use a nail brush instead of a toothbrush as they are cleaned outside of the mouth and the nail brush allows for more surface area to be covered at one time and also is an easier thing for you to grab rather than a small handle toothbrush. Let me be clear, I'm not promoting that you all have your teeth extracted so you can avoid using a toothbrush. Just this information is only for those who have dentures, obviously. There are topical fluoride gel treatments that you can use at home and can be applied during your periodic visits to the dentist. Consult your dentist who could be able to recommend the dose and the frequency and use of products such as these topical fluoride gels. Try to use something to clean in between your teeth. If you have decreased dexterity that makes flossing out of the question, you could use something called a proxy brush or soft plastic picks that work well. Often these can also be um, received from your, at your dental office, but are also available over the counter at your local drug mart. If swallowing or choking is a problem, and makes you, using about, makes you nervous about using mouth rinses, 
You can use your toothbrush or a cotton swab to apply one of these. Just as with toothpaste, mouth rinses should not contain alcohol as they try as they tend to dry your mouth. Your dentist again could pro provide um, a chlorhexidine rinse which can be put on your toothbrush or a cotton swab instead of using a toothbrush or instead of using as well, a, a, use it as a mouth rinse. And don't forget about good old baking soda, which may be old fashioned, but when dissolved in a glass of water, can also act as a very effective mouthwash. Another thing to consider is the problem of nutritional deficiency, which sometimes occurs in conjunction with diminished dental care in people with Parkinson's. It stands to reason that if your teeth are defective, food intake may become a problem. You may no longer be able to eat the food you prefer. Since protein and other dietary requirements are altered in more advanced Parkinson's, Dental health needs to be considered to be a major factor in nutritional management. Poor dental health is one of the main contributing factors to speech problems. I don't know if you've ever thought about what a big um, issue it is for people who have poor uh, teeth and dental issues um, and their effect on speech. But Issues with loose teeth, missing teeth, and defective dentures all affect one's ability to be able to speak clearly. So this is another very good reason to find ways to maintain or enhance your current dental health regime. I have referred to swallowing problems a few times today, I know. It's just common sense, but if teeth are missing, Gum tissues are, are inflamed or infected, causing pain, and if teeth are sensitive to either hot or cold foods, these can all result, result in food not being chewed, chewed properly, which can in turn result in the potential for choking. And what about loss of self-esteem? Speech impairment? Loss of facial expression, compromised swallowing reflexes, which can, which can lead, lead to drooling, involuntary movements, to name but a few reasons why people with Parkinson's sometimes don't feel very desirable and attractive to their loved ones and family. Add to that broken, decayed teeth that are filled with plaque not to mention bad breath. It's no wonder some people with Parkinson's choose to isolate themselves and eat alone to avoid embarrassment. This is so sad because these things are indefinitely preventable and gives individuals more confidence to socialize and be part of their family and community activities. I know people with Parkinson's want to remain as independent as possible for as long as possible. But please don't compromise your dental health by refusing to ask and accept assistance with your daily oral health routines. You are just doing yourselves a disservice if you're too stubborn as you will be the loser in the long run. For those caregivers listening today who are encountering some dental issues with their loved ones, here are a few tips that might help to assist your loved ones with their mouth care. Attempt oral hygiene care at a time when everything is quiet, calm, and distraction-free. Your loved one is liable to be anxious when you're doing something so personal for them. And we know that Parkinson's symptoms are made worse with anxiety, so the quieter, the better. 
If the per person with Parkinson's has a hard time keeping their mouth open for any length of time, or if there are excessive head, tongue, and jaw movements, try cleaning only a small section of the mouth at a time. I know this means you'll have to attempt this several times a day, but it should make the task less frustrating and at the same time help your, help your loved one maintain a clean and healthier mouth. So again, some of the tips that I've talked about today I think bear repeating. Consider an electric toothbrush as they decrease the need for manual dexterity and can reach the curved surfaces of the teeth. Try to get a non-moving brush, brush head and rotating or vibrating bristles as this minimizes the amount of brush movement and will make it easier to control the brush. If you, again, if you prefer to use a regular toothbrush, get one with a wider handle and ensure that it has soft bristles. Another tip, rinse your mouth after each meal and snack. This helps remove food debris, sugars, and bacterial food sources. If you use a mouth rinse, make sure it does not contain alcohol. Again, there is a rinse that your doctor, or your, excuse me, your dentist can prescribe called chlorhexidine. And if swallowing is a problem, apply your mouth rinses with a toothbrush or a cotton swab. Use something between your teeth, like a small proxa brush or a, some kind of a pick, not the wooden kind that can break off but something that is plastic and more durable. As no brush can effectively clean between your teeth and under your gum tissues, and that's often where problems will arise. If your mouth is dry, chew sugarless gum or suck sugarless candy, as this, as this will stimulate saliva flow. Chronic dry mouth can also be alleviated by carrying a small bottle of water with a squirt top to frequently moisten your mouth. Regular dental checkups are very important in pre preventing extensive damage to both your teeth and your gums. I'm not sure if you're already doing this or not, but I think it's a very important issue to make sure that your dentist and his or her staff have some understanding about Parkinson's and in particular how it is affecting you personally. By better understanding the changes you are experiencing, they can modify standard treatments to meet your needs and make your dental appointments more successful for both you as well as them. Be sure to plan your dental appointments when you are on and your medications are working well. Some people find that if their medications are working well first thing in the morning, they plan their visits first thing in the morning so that the waiting times tend to be shorter in case your dentist gets behind, your schedule, gets behind schedule as the day goes on and you then have to sit for a long time waiting for your turn in the chair. Be sure to take your levodopa at least 60 to 90 minutes prior to your office visit to take advantage of your peak response period, which will improve your ability to meet the demands of a dental examination. If a series of several brief visits would be better for you in the long run, then schedule your appointments accordingly. As Parkinson's progresses, the amount of time during which a person responds optimally to Parkinson's medication will become gradually less. So shorter visits 
may be more realistic and definitely more productive in the long run. If mobility issues substantially interfere with access to professional oral care, i.e., if you can't get out to your dentist's office on a regular basis, there are mobile dental hygiene services available that will provide on-site care for people with Parkinson's in the comfort of your home, as well as they do go into long-term care facilities. If this is of interest to you, we can provide you with some contact information for these services. Again, remember, use a, a toothpaste that has a high fluoride content. Use sugarless chewing gums or candy throughout the day if dry mouth is an issue. Who would have ever thought that chewing gum could be so beneficial for either dry mouth as well as as a cue to prompt you swallowing. The last tip is that sometimes a hard piece of cheese at the end of a meal can also help rid food that remains in the mouth. So I've had a couple of questions given to me today that I want to uh, share with you. The first is more of a little bit of a story but I think it's very indicative of the kinds of things that I've been trying to address today. So I'm going to share those with you just now. So I've had a very nice uh, email from the care partner of a person whose husband has had Parkinson's for 10 years, but is also being challenged with dementia. And this gentleman with Parkinson's has also had a stroke and is on several different medications for both his heart issues as well as his Parkinson's. So a year and a half ago, an x-ray, a dental x-ray, indicated that he had decay under a, one of his crowns, although it was not evident that the decay was causing the person with Parkinson's any discomfort. After a discussion with the, both the uh, dentist as well as the family doctor, the decision was taken at that time to basically let sleeping dogs lie and just leave things alone. Uh, the person with Parkinson's goes for dental cleaning and checkups three times a year, and during the last visit, the hygienist thought that the person with Parkinson's uh, did have some sensation. The dentist suggested that uh, we, in, uh, instead of uh, fixing the tooth, and putting the, the patient, I'm sure, through something like root canal, etc., that maybe the, the tooth should be extracted. The caregiver in this case suggested that perhaps the extraction should be done in a hospital setting under a general anesthetic. Um, she asked for um, a referral to the dental clinic at Sunnybrook. They arrived to the appointment at Sunnybrook, but due to the fact that the person with Parkinson's, the husband in this case, was on um, a heart medication, the dentist wanted to get permission for him to be removed from the medication for a few days before the extraction. I believe this medication would have led to more excessive bleeding. Um, the dentist at the time tapped the tooth and he did not feel that the patient was experiencing any pain. The caregiver's question to the dentist was, should we do this now or should we wait until he actually feels pain? The response is likely best to do it now because the patient could possibly be less able to respond and deal with an extraction down the road. The care partner in this case has not contacted the family doctor or Sunnybrook. The six-month follow-up with the neurologist will be in July. 
so she thought this would be important to discuss all of this with him. This particular lady uh, is saying that she uh, was glad to be having me discuss this issue today, and I'm really glad that this individual has written uh, this email to me because what it does is it once again outlines how many layers of issues that there are when it comes to something that theoretically should be quite straightforward when it comes to dental care and Parkinson's. It's easy for people to say, oh, you must brush, brush and floss, etc., etc." But when you have all of these other issues, heart issues and other medical issues um, superimposed on dental issues, including something like dementia and cognitive challenges and one's ability to be able to let people know if things are act actually hurting or not. All of these things have to come into play. So it, as I said, it really just underlines the importance of good, as good as possible dental care and checkups at all times and the importance for continuing um, importance to be put on the fact that your teeth play a very important part in not only your ability to chew, your ability to speak, your ability to be able to swallow, um, everything comes into play here. Another question that I've had, and thank you again for people uh, sending questions to me, um, this person says, I have noticed that I bite my upper lip more frequently. Is this common as Parkinson's and dyskin dyskinesias um, advance or increase? I would say that yes, I think it is quite common. And I do suspect that in this case, that biting the upper lip is probably as a result of uh, jaw and mouth movement involved with dyskinesias. Dyskinesias are those uh, wiggly, wobbly movements, excessive involuntary movements that people sometimes develop after taking um, levodopa for, for many years. So I think the answer is yes. This is common. Um, I don't really have a suggestion um, as to whether or not uh, what could be done about that problem. But what I can do, I do have your email address. And what I can do is see if I could um, get a suggestion. Um, I do know a couple of dentists that I could approach about this and see if I can get a suggestion for you. And if I can, then I will definitely uh, write back to you with, uh, with something that I can find that might help this. Uh, last but not least for today, I have another question. And that is, should Parkinson patients have more regular dental cleanings than otherwise might be the case? So I don't know about more, although I, I think really that's a discussion that you should have with your dentist and your dental hygienist. Because I think that the symptoms uh, that will show up during, especially during your cleaning appointments, might indicate that you have more cavities and more gum disease uh, than, than you would normally have had without uh, Parkinson's. So again, the answer I think is, I don't think it can be just a blanket. Yes, people with Parkinson's should have more regular, more regular dental cleaning. Let your hygienist um, especially give you some guidance in this direction depending on what she sees when she is cleaning your teeth, as there will be red flags for her about the fact that 
you have, again, the being developed, de de developing more cavities and or um, the, you have gum disease, which will indicate that you're not able to do your in-home dental hygiene um, as, uh, as you have been in the past, and that, that it, is, it is not being as effective as it once was. So again, are there any issues with wearing a mouth guard at night? Again, I cannot say that this is just something that everybody uh, with who has a mouth guard should, should be aware of. Are there issues? Um, again, I think that you need to be guided about what is going on as Parkinson's progresses whether or not this is something that is safe for the individuals with Parkinson's to have in their mouth at night. Um, it's not a one-size-fits-all. I am personally not aware of issues with mouth guards being a problem for people with Parkinson's. Um, in doing my research for my presentation today, um, I did come across a couple of um, documents that said that mouth guards can be um, helpful for some people with Parkinson's, especially if they are, quote, grinding their teeth in their sleep. And so, again, um, if, if this would, if that's a problem, like I don't know why this particular individual is wearing a mouth guard, but it has to do with uh, stopping the uh, grinding of the, the individual's teeth uh, at night and is not a problem, um, then again, I think it's one of those very individualized uh, symptom issues that um, cannot be generalized. So um, are there any issues? Um, only if you are aware that there might be issues going forward. Um, so again, it, people, lots of people wear mouth guards mainly because they what we call uh, rucks or, or grind their teeth during their sleep. And uh, so again, um, I would continue to use the mouth guard, but um, be, just be aware that Parkinson's can sometimes cause problems with many things that one would not normally associate with being a problem. So and we have one more question that oh, came in. Okay. Uh, I'll just read it because it came online. Okay. Uh, do you have any information re osteoporosis medication and the reluctance of dentists to do dental extraction? Hmm. Okay, so Debbie, do you think that, okay, I'm going to repeat the question. Do I have any information about osteoporosis medications and the reluctance, and the reluctance of dentists dental to do extractions. extractions if somebody is taking those medications? Are they, is this a, is a question related to each other? Um, I'm not sure this is exactly how it came in. Yeah. Okay. So uh, that's exactly how it came in online. Okay. Osteoporosis meds. And reluctance of dentists to do dental extraction. Okay. Um, okay. So what I'm going to do is, um, again, along with the other question about the individual who's biting their lip uh, more frequently, um, I'm going to look into this um, and see if that's something that uh, needs to be addressed. And what I'll do is the next time, the next session, um, and unfortunately, at this very time, I've just realized I don't have my topic yet for next month. So I'll get right on that because Debbie, my CEO and boss, is sitting right here in the room beside me, and I know she's going to say, so what is your next topic going to be, Sandy? And I don't have that today at the moment. Sorry about that, guys. Um, I will have one in the very near future so she can let you know what next time's topic will be. But I will... Um, I'll address these two questions that I don't have the answers for um, at the beginning of, of uh, August session. Gosh, I can't believe August. Here I'm wishing the summer away. 
Anyway, thank you all for your questions and uh, for your attention to today. And uh, I hope that uh, it's been beneficial for you. Take care, everybody. Enjoy your summer between now and August, and I'll see you then. Bye for now. The leader has turned lecture off, and your lines have been unmuted.